All right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining. Um, we're going to be talking through first off the differences between old GA Universal Analytics and GA4. Just so for, for folks that are used to old GA, just one of the some of the nuances there and, and differences. Then we'll get into the interface itself, walk you through how to set up um, some custom reports and, and get familiar with uh, the reporting there. And certainly ask questions as we go through it using the Q&A function. So if you have any questions, um, certainly uh, ask. And I can you know, pause here and there if we have questions throughout. Um, otherwise, we'll have a, a, a section at the end for questions as well. So to get started, um, one of the bigger things, if you're used to old GA, the difference is, is there's no more views available. Um, so views were very commonly used to filter down your property. Um, so you could kind of control what type of data gets shown in all of the reports inside that view. Uh, unfortunately, that's no longer available. Um, so it's a little problematic at times, depending on the structure and, and how you set up your GA. Um, however, there are new filters that you can apply to your reports. So you can do something similar to what views did. However, the filtering only works report by report. So you kind of have to get those set up on each report. Um, you can save those. Uh, so um, you don't have to change it every time you come back to a report. Um, but there isn't a kind of overarching filter that goes across the entire property, unfortunately. So that's one of the, the bigger changes there. Uh, we'll, who knows if it ever comes back, it'd be great if, if they did, but um, right now we don't have that availability. Um, another thing I want to focus on a bit is sessions. Um, so sessions are visits to your website, right? So if someone comes to your site, um, they spend time there, they leave, whatever. So that's, that's a session. Um, and sessions are, are become inactive if someone uh, is inactive on your site for more than 30 minutes. So let's say someone comes to your site, um, they keep the tab open, they stop browsing, they go to another tab, and then they come back to the, your site after 30 minutes, a new session would then start. Um, so that's that's no different than old GA. Um, Universal Analytics work the same way as GA4 there does. Um, however, the one big distinction there is, and how GA4 works, is if the session has a new source of traffic, um, it won't break the session, and a new session won't start over. And what that means is, uh, probably the best example it, it, in the e-commerce space is, is a good example there. Um, if you go to it, someone's checkout <clears throat> on a website, and let's say there's a promo code field, and you go off and you go um, go look at another uh, look for a promo code, you find a code, you click through on it, and it brings you back to the site. Now Google is seeing a new source of traffic. Maybe they started an email, and now they're going off to an, or an affiliate site and coming back to the site. A new source of traffic is coming through, and in old GA, that could have restarted your session. Uh, because a new source of traffic comes in, it breaks the first session and starts a new one. Um, and so now GA4 does a better job of that. So if a new source of traffic comes to the site during that, that 30 minutes of that, that someone's active, it won't start a new session. It actually, it actually uh, takes and stores both sources of traffic, um, but it, only, it won't break the session. So what that means is it, you may see a lower session count in GA4 than in old GA um, because it does a better job of tracking sessions uh, than old GA did. So don't be surprised if you see fewer sessions uh, in GA4 because of that. If you see a lot of, a, a big difference, like 15, 20, 30%, there's probably something wrong. If it's in that 5% range, um, you're probably pretty good. And um, that's just how GA4 is tracking differently than old GA. Great. So there's a new metric that Google's introduced, and it's called engage sessions. Uh, and engagement is basically, um, it, it's kind of Google's way of moving away from bounce rate um, and trying to understand how users are interacting with the site and engaging with the site. And so what they did is uh, it, it does a better job now of tracking how long someone's on a, on a page or on the website. So if someone's on your site for more than 10 seconds, or they view two or more pages, or actually if you scroll to the bottom of the page, I think they've actually removed this one. 
um, or they have a conversion. If any of those things are true, that's considered an engaged session. So before in old GA, there was no concept of engaged sessions. Um, there was basically, you could kind of create these interactions and push these interactive hits so that Google would understand like someone clicked on a button or they went to a new page or they viewed a video. All of those things could be um, interaction points that we had to kind of custom set up and push into GA. GA4 does a little better job of tracking that engagement. And that 10 second rule in particular, that one there is going to um, increase your engagement rate relative to what it was in old GA. In old GA, that would be considered a bounce. Like someone could come to your site and they could be on your homepage and maybe they're there for five minutes. They're kind of browsing around and then they leave. Um, that would actually be considered a bounce once they close the tab out and the session ends. Um, but in GA4, because it has that 10 second kind of beacon that it sends out or the, the, the time um, engagement time that kind of sends out, it understands how, how long you're on the site uh, much better than old GA did. So don't be surprised if, um, if you see uh, your, your engaged sessions, uh, your, your engaged sessions are probably going to be higher than what um, your bounce rate was before. And I'll talk about that in a sec. So that, that's a much different way of tracking. It's a much a cleaner way of tracking sessions. We have a question from for the slide before yeah, that I think is super relevant from Perla. So it says, is it double counting a session then if counting both sources? It was from no, the previous slide. Um, no, it doesn't it doesn't double count the session that in old GA it would. Um, in GA4, it will it just keeps track of the fact that there was multiple sources during the session but it doesn't restart the session. It doesn't start a new, there's not a new session count that occurs. So um, in the example I gave, that would still be one session, but just multiple sources. Um, really the only real way to get to the source, every source that is associated with the session is using BigQuery. Um, and BigQuery is a way to basically connect your GA4 data to Google's database um, or data warehouse. And you can pass all of your GA data into BigQuery. And then you can do very kind of minute um, kind of raw queries against all the data. So it's kind of getting on the kind of very heavy analytics side of things. If you were to do that, you would be able to see all if there's multiple sources of traffic for a particular session, you'd be able to identify that. In the standard reporting, you're not going to have great visibility into um, if there was multiple sources of traffic per session. But just know that it is still, it's only going to count one session, even if there are multiple sources. Does that help answer that question, I hope? I think so. Okay. Great. Um, so yeah, certainly ask more if you, as you have them here. Um, so one other distinction is users versus total users. So uh, you'll see in all your reporting, there's a metric for users. Users, all, there was also a metric in old GA for users as well. Um, in GA4, users actually means engaged users. So what that means is when you're looking at your report and you have this number, we've got 1,400 users in this, in this time frame. In, in this report, we're using users is actually the engaged users. So users that had an engaged session during that time, it would actually remove any users that have it, had an unengaged session during that time. So if you're doing, again, if you're doing any kind of comparison to old GA and GA4, um, if you're looking at users in old GA, that was total users. There is a metric you can add to your report called total users in GA4 if you want to customize your reports. Um, so there is a way to kind of get back to that same type of metric. But users, as it's shown in GA4, is a bit different. So you may see some variances there if you're doing any kind of comparisons. Great, so um, engagement time. So as I mentioned before, Google GA4 does a better job of tracking engagement because it has this kind of time stamp beacon that it sends out to understand if someone's actually, maybe they're just sitting on, your, on a page and maybe they're reading a blog post and they're on there for several minutes because um, you know, they're scrolling down and reading and whatever. Um, old GA didn't have a good sense of how long they might have been watching, viewing a page and interacting that way. 
Uh, GA4 does a much better job with that because it does have these beacons that it sends out to understand how long someone's engaging. So because of that, uh, in old GA, um, if someone just came to, let's say they do a search on Google, they find your site, um, they click through on a blog post and they're reading it, they're on there for, you know, like I said, five minutes, then they leave, they don't do anything else, that's a bounce. And, and in fact, in old GA, that was a zero second time on site or a zero second page view. So um, it actually didn't do a great job of measuring that engagement. GA4 does a much better job of this. So if you do, if you are content heavy and you do drive a decent amount of traffic um, from organic search in particular, um, those can tend to be traffic that may not necessarily take a next step. It may not go convert or do other things. It may, they may just be there for um, uh, reading the blog post and they leave. In that case, it would have been a bounce. In this case, it's still, um, if, they're, if they're there longer than 10 seconds, it's now an engaged session and no longer a bounce. Okay, another new metric is engagement rate. So similar to what we've been talking about, engagement rate is, is basically the number of engaged sessions div divided by the total number of sessions. So if you have 72 visitors to your site that are, or sessions to your site that are engaged and you had 100 total sessions, you have a 72% engagement rate. And that's actually now the inverse of bounce rate. So bounce rate in this scenario, you'd have a bounce rate of 28% because you had 28% of, of the sessions were not engaged. And so they effectively bounced. So you do not have bounce rate at um, just at the beginning when you first get into GA4. There's no bounce rate in your reporting. It's, use, it's using engagement rate. So it's just the, the opposite. Um, however, you can add bounce rate to your reports. If you want to see bounce rate, again, it's a different measure. It measures it differently than it did in old GA. Um, but you can add it to your reports if you're more comfortable kind of thinking about it that way. Okay, I'll pause there just to make, make sure there's no questions coming through because um, we're gonna switch over a little bit to attribution. Um, so- Yeah, we do, we do have a couple. Great. Let me check. So, Perla, when looking at the traffic acquisition report, does the first source trump the second? Yes, that's a great question. And the traffic acquisition report does trump, the, the first source trumps the second. So in that particular report, if someone were to convert, like someone comes to the site from email, and then that case before, as I explained, maybe they go to affiliate and come back, uh, and then they check out or they, they convert in, in any way, this, the, the channel that will get the credit in that case will be email. It'll be the first source of that session. So that's a great question. It's very confusing how Google kind of stitches all this together. Um, and it's not really clear on what report shows what source it's, it's using. Um, but in the, the, the standard report, the traffic acquisition report, which is probably the main report most people are using, it is using that first source um, that drove that session. All right. Great. And then, Great. thank you. We have uh, another question that is regarding migrating over to GA4, but I don't know if you want to take it later after the presentation. Um, yeah, let's pause on that one and I'll keep going and then yeah, yes. we'll definitely get to that in a sec. Yeah, great. Okay, we'll go back to this, Glenn, in a sec. Thanks. Great. Okay, so- all right, that's um, all. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay, so focusing on attribution. Um, so attribution is like the whole point of Google Analytics or one of the biggest points is to understand how traffic and traffic sources are contributing to conversions, right? So, and, and how is that traffic and that those sources getting attributed to the conversion? And so there's two different models now, um, last click and data driven. Last click is the standard that's been around forever. Google Analytics has always used this last click model, um, aside from the kind of what is nuances we were talking about different sources, but last click's always been used. Um, and to give some examples of that, and, and technically it's last non-direct click. And so what that means is, let's say, you know, you've got your site, you've got some display ads going somewhere, right? And someone clicks through on a, display, a banner ad, they come to your site, that's the first introduction to your site. 
Then they see a post on social, they click through, then they search and they find you on paid search and they come through, they sign up for your email and then they uh, click through on an email that you send out to them and then they finally convert, right? So not atypical, right? Usually people aren't converting the first time they come, there's multiple touch points. So in this case, 100% of the credit is gonna go to email because it's the last touch, the last click that drove the conversion. So in this case, 100% goes to email. In another scenario, someone, same kind of thing, comes from display, then social, then paid search, but then they type in your address and they get to your site directly um, and then they convert. In that case, paid search is gonna get 100% of the credit because even though there was one more session after that, it was a direct session, uh, Google is gonna give credit to paid search because it's the last non-direct. So if there's ever a time where Google knows there is a source of traffic before um, whatever converted, uh, if it was direct that came through, then it's going to uh, give credit to paid search. Okay, so that's the standard model that's been used. It's still the standard model that you'd use in that traffic acquisition report, the, the main report that we typically are going to be using. However, Google has introduced a data-driven model. I mean, the data-driven model is um, used to um, basically give credit or attribution to multiple channels. Because in this scenario, we have basically four channels that contributed to, to a conversion. But in last click model, it's only giving credit to one. In the data-driven model, it will give credit and partial credit to different channels, depending on how Google kind of sees that channel contributing to the conversion. So if uh, maybe email will get a little bit more credit because it kind of closed it, but maybe paid search will get quite a bit because it was like the second channel. You know, Google's using its machine learning to kind of figure all this stuff out. It doesn't really tell us how it's using it or creating these, um, but there is, that is the way um, the data-driven model is used. Interestingly though, the data-driven model and, and how the conversion piece, even if you have, like, by default, when you set up a GA property, the data-driven model is the default uh, attribution model that's that's set up on every GA4 property. However, it doesn't show up in the reporting the way you'd think it would. Like that traffic acquisition report, the main one, it doesn't use the data-driven model. The conversion report does. Um, and there's another modeling report that does as well. So that's a little bit confusing. Just want to make sure that everybody's kind of clear on that. But um, even though you can get at the data-driven information, your main report is most likely going to be using that last click model. Oh, Paul, any questions coming through on that? Yeah, Usman. So it says, it sounds like the data-driven model isn't exactly using the linear attribution model and Google automatically figures out which channel should earn more credit, right? Yeah, it's definitely not linear. Um, so linear would kind of, would potentially give kind of equal credit to all the channels as, um, as you work through uh, that kind of user journey, uh, as you have different sources, uh, data-driven is going to give partial credit to different channels depending on how they may have contributed to the conversion um, and not, not linearly. So maybe, maybe the first channel that drove the traffic might get a little bit more credit because that was kind of the introducing channel. Um, and then the last channel might be get a little bit more because that was the converting channel. Maybe some in the middle will get a little bit more, a little bit of credit. So Again, we don't really have good insight into how that's being used, um, but that's it's, it's more um, kind of incremental credit can be given to different channels depending. All right, thanks, Usman. Great. Uh, we don't have any more questions around okay. this, so let's go. Yeah. Okay, let's go. All right, so um, GA4 is very event-based and event-focused, okay? So in old GA, you could set up events and push events, um, but everything in GA4 is associated to an event. A page view is an, uh, is an event. Um, a user engagement kind of tracking is an event. Scrolling is an event. Clicking is an event. All these things are events that get pushed into GA4. And so um, some of these are automatically captured. Things like page views, user engagement, session start. Those things are automatically captured just by having the Google Analytics tracking on your site. Uh, there's other things that have to be set up. Things like... Um, free signups, like if you have a sign-up form, you have 
Um, you're, you're, if you're an e-com, you have purchase events, all those things have to be custom, but there are some of those that are automatically set. But just know that everything in GA4 is associated to an event. And from those events um, is where you get to uh, your conversions, right? So um, old GA had goals and you could go and configure goals any way you wanted to. You could put all these, a lot of these fancy rules against um, how the traffic's behaving to identify a goal. Um, that's no longer the case for the most part. Um, you, every goal or every conversion has to be associated to an event. So if you have an event that you've tracked, like someone signs up uh, a free trial or something, and you have a free sign up event, you can toggle that on as a conversion. So as long as you have an event that's being tracked and monitored in GA4, you can make it a conversion. So the, the other side of that though, is if you don't have an event, you can't set it as a conversion. So you do have to work to get events pushed into GA4 if you wanna track certain things that aren't automatically tracked. Great, uh, I'm gonna skip over this one. We're gonna to jump to this one. So, all right, UTM parameters. Um, UTM parameters are, really critical to have accurate. They always have been, but um, if you're using the default channel groups that GA4 has, um, they've actually introduced several other channels. And the channels are just like the high level category that all of your traffic will fall into. And so we have things like affiliate, email, SMS, paid shopping, paid social, organic social, that kind of stuff. So a lot of these are new. Um, and so Google has expanded out the number of ch default channels that are available. Uh, and so if you want to continue to use the default channel groups, you have to make sure your UTM parameters are squeaky clean, um, that they're set up exactly as they're needed or as GA4 kind of rules are set. So um, UTM parameters are things like UTM source, UTM medium, UTM campaign. There's several others UTM parameters, but these are the ones that are used to identify what channel the traffic is gonna fall into. So a UTM source example would be something like Facebook and a medium would be something like paid social. And in that case, if um, you have a source of Facebook and a medium of paid social, it's gonna fall into the paid social channel. So here's a just two examples of the rules. There's lots of other rules, um, but if you send out emails to folks, it's good to have your all of your links in your emails using UTM parameters because then um, it'll tell Google, hey, this is coming from an email, um, not from gmail.com or from, you know, uh, if it's in Outlook, it might come from a direct, it won't bucket the right way. So if you set it up, uh, your UTM parameters with uh, the proper source or medium, it'll fall in the right channel. So in this case, your, your source for email has to be either email or any of these variations. Medium has to be email or any of these variations. It can't have anything else with it. It can't be email dash something or, or retarget email or anything like that. It has to be just the word email. And so if that, that the rule if that follows that rule, it'll fall into the email uh, bucket. And same thing with like paid social, right? So if it's coming from a source of social traffic that Google knows about, like Facebook and Pinterest and Instagram and all the ones that it knows about, um, and the medium contains CP or PPC or starts with paid. If any of those are true, then um, it'll fall into paid social. If it doesn't match those rules, it's not gonna fall into paid social. So you gotta make sure that you've got your, uh, your UTM parameters set up exactly as um, they're defined or else they'll fall into unassigned or sometimes direct depending, but a lot of times it'll fall into unassigned. So I do have this um, handy uh, UTM builder that I created for GA4 specifically. Um, it's at utmprep.com. It's free to use. You can go after it and, and use it anytime you want. But basically it's just, you can come in here and select the channel that you wanna create your builder for, or your URLs from, um, enter in all of the parameters, and then it'll, it'll create a, a nice uh, URL for you that you can use in your, in your media, right? So you can copy that and bring it over. There's also a way to validate your URLs as well. Um, so you can bring this in here. If you have a URL already, it'll tell you what channel it'll fall into. So, and all the rules too, you can kind of look at the rules up here too. So it's a nice little tool to, to get familiar with the, the UTM parameters and, and how the channels work. You can create custom channel groups as well. If you don't want to use the default channel groups, we're not going to get too much into that. 
Um, but you definitely can do that as well um, if, if you want to customize um, or use different UTM parameters. I typically recommend using the default as much as you can because it just makes it easier. Okay, I'll pause for any questions coming through. Yeah, we have a question about uh, reports. And then I have another question about uh, data looking different in Looker Studio. Okay. So um, should we go to the uh, report one? Yeah, let's jump in the reporting. Oh, yeah, let's jump in the reporting here. And yeah, you can, why don't you bring that question up and I can get into that one. Yeah. So this is from Graciela. Great. Perfect question. Well, okay. Out. Yeah. This is a, this is an interesting one, right? So, um, in your standard reports, I've got a couple extras I've added here, so don't pay attention to these yet. Um, but we have in your standard reports, you're most likely going to have user acquisition and traffic acquisition. So, traffic acquisition is the report I was just kind of talking about uh, more recently, uh, where this is kind of all based based on last. This is based on last click or the last source that drove the session. So everything in here, this is most similar to the old GA report where it's tracking the, the latest source of the traffic um, and what drove that traffic and what ended up leading to a conversion um, in, in that case. So this is all kind of last touch type of reporting. The user acquisition report is tracking the first source of traffic that the, the user used to get to your site. So if the first time I came to your site, I, maybe I saw a Facebook post, right? That I clicked through on that, I came to your site. So now I, as a user, am bucketed into paid or social, right? Paid social, organic social, whatever it was. I'm now in the social bucket. Actually, let me change this to default channel groups, right? So now I, I, I'm gonna fall into organic social now, okay? I'm never going to fall out of organic social because I'm always in that bucket as a user. I, that's the first introducing channel for me. And so every time this report, it, it, um, depending on the date range, like let's say I come back this month, maybe, let's say I came to your site three months ago, I come back this month. I'll show up in this organic social report this month and next month and every other month that I come back to your site, I'll always show up in this in the, the or, organic social bucket because that was the first channel that introduced me as a user. So this is a great report to understand how, um, how your channels are bringing those users for the first time to your site versus the traffic acquisition report is more for those uh, what's driving your, your most recent visit um, and, and that most recent session. Does that help answer that question? Okay, yes. great. Sure. Okay. We have funny. another one yeah, by Perla. Just very, very good question. So it says, death by UTMs. In the past, UTMs supplied to internal links was a big no-no because Universal would count, double count the visit. Is this still the case in GA4? Um, I would still highly recommend never using UTM parameters in your internal links. Um, even though Google is not going to restart the session, like it did in old GA, it would totally break. You would be double counting all over the place if you used in UTMs in your internal linking in old GA. In GA4, it's not going to restart the session, but it's still going to associate that session or the, that source with that, that UTM parameter uh, for, that, for that session. There's better ways to track internal linking than with UTM parameters. UTM parameters are, were designed for external traffic coming to your site not to manage your internal links and everything else. It can cause a lot of problems. I highly recommend not using them. There, there's easier ways. If you want to track a link, put like a click ID or a click link ID or something that has nothing to do with UTMs on your links. Um, there's even better ways to do it without actually putting things on your UTMs uh, or sorry, on your URLs on internally through Google Tag Manager. You can kind of track internal linking differently and the, the text that people are clicking on and the URL they're going to, and you can pass it over as an event, there's much better ways to do it. So I would highly encourage not to, uh, to avoid UTMs internally. Um, just, there's just other better ways to do it. Awesome. Let's get Great. into 
the next part. Great. Okay. So um, in your reports, everything is customizable in GA4 in terms of the reporting, which is great. Old GA, we had no real flexibility in the customization for the most part. Um, so here we have, um, we can customize these reports really any way you want. Um, there's some limitations, but you, you, can, you can basically adjust these how you want. So let's say we have this traffic acquisition report. This is a standard report. You, you'll all see we have um, your default channel groups. You can select and change out what dimension you're looking at in the report here. So I can say, instead of looking at the channel, I wanna look at my source medium if I wanna get more specific on, on what's driving the traffic. Um, so you can, you can drop this down. You can also add a secondary dimension. So if I wanna kind of uh, line up my traffic sources. So here I've got uh, my default channel groups aligned up with my source medium. So you can, that's kind of a handy way to see your channels with your source mediums coming through. And then um, all of your metrics, users and sessions, and as I was talking about before, engage sessions, right? So this is the new metric, um, engagement rate, all of these metrics um, come kind of out of the, out of the box here. But if you don't want all of these things, or you want to create a new type of report um, that's more specific, you can do that. So let's say, for instance, um, I want to create more of a uh, maybe an organic search report. So I can customize this report by clicking on the little pencil here. And then uh, let's say I don't want all of this information here. I can, I can change my metrics if I want. So I can add and remove different metrics. And I can also, let's say I want a conversion rate to be added because that can be kind of handy, right? So um, I can add my conversion rate. And let's say my site doesn't actually track revenue. Um, I, I only want to care about conversions and conversion rate. Um, I can do that. I don't really care about events per session. Um, and that's probably pretty, and that's, add, let's out, let's add bounce rate just, just for the heck of it. So now we've got bounce rate next to engagement rate. They're just going to be opposite, but still we'll, we'll throw it in there. And now I can apply that. So now I've got this nice report that um, changes out the metrics that I just added here. So I've got my bounce rate, my conversion rate, I removed revenue. Um, now I can add a filter on here that is by channel. And I can say my, my member, don't use first user default channel group, use the session default channel group, because that's going to give you the most recent session um, source of traffic. And I can say my session default channel group is uh, exactly matches. And in this case, I'm going to select organic search. So I can apply that. And now I'm just seeing organic search here. And maybe I want to change this so I can see my source mediums to see where those are coming from. So in my dimension here, I can actually drag this up, make this my default and apply that. And now when I come in at my report, it's gonna be my organic search report with the source mediums that are driving that. I get a lot of traffic from DuckDuckGo here apparently. Um, so now I can save this as a new report and I can call this organic performance. And boom, now I've got a save, nice, a nice organic report. Um, and I can now come back here and I can add it to my reports. It doesn't automatically show up anywhere. This is where you come into your library and your library is all, where all your reports are and how you can kind of adjust and, and customize everything. So I come down to my library and you have these collections. So these are collections over here. Life cycle is a collection. And these are topics underneath that collection. So acquisition, engagement, monetization, these are all topics. So I can edit my collection, go find the report I just created. So let's go find my, my where was it? Organic social, organic performance, drag that over. And now I can save it. And now I've got a nice organic, I didn't have the word search, but organic search performance report. Okay, so you can do this with any channel you have. You could even create your own little um, topic section and build out all these different reports based on channel if you want. Um, that way, whoever's kind of managing your channels can just jump into that section or if you don't want to keep filtering on things, um, that's one way to quickly do that. I'll right, pause for questions there. Yeah, so I'm. we still have this uh, question 
by Glenn about migrating over to GA4. Yeah. Yeah, let's, we can talk let's about go. It. Yeah. So while on topic of difference, when migrating over to GA4, I noticed it's an intended new property as such. One thing I found an issue is the migration does not take the historical traffic from all GA4 from all GA yeah. universal. Yeah, they're completely different systems, completely different way that they track. There's no way to bring your old GA data into GA4. Um, so hopefully you had GA4 set up um, at least several months ago or um, to kind of build up some other history. If you didn't, the only real way to stitch the two together is in like a Looker Studio scenario where you have, you basically have to either use um, the Google APIs to kind of pull the data out into maybe Google Sheets. And then from Google Sheets, you then stitch that back together with the GA4 data. So um, that there is a way to do it. It's possible. Um, but just know that your data is very different. Like session counts are different. User counts are different. Like some of these metrics are different. So you got to be really careful if you do try to stitch the data together because they're just not, it's not the same. And so you're going to make, put yourself in a position where you're comparing different dates that have different data sets and it might kind of throw things off. So there is no way to bring the data into GA4. You can do it in another, another tool like Looker Studio, um, but it's uh, complicated somewhat to do and it may not you know, necessarily give you all the data that you want, um, but it definitely do a lot. I'm working on it with a couple of clients um, to do that. So um, we just got to be very careful about what the nuances are there. Amazing, thank you. Which uh, this leads me to my next question, which is, it's not from, it's not mine. I, this is from Laura James from the Women in Tech SEO Slack community. So it says, why is there so much discrepancy often between charts and Looker Studio and GA4? I'm applying the same filters and pulling in the same data, let's say sessions, but often it can differ between charts. And maybe it's because it's a different way of interpreting data, but I, I will leave you answer yeah. that. There's a couple different ways this can happen. Um, if you're, there's, there's can be thresholding that gets applied to the data there is sampling that can apply to the data. Um, all of the data in GA4 here is in this reporting section is aggregated. And so there's already some kind of um, combinations of data that are already happening behind the scenes. And so it's not like a pure set of data. And some of it's even modeled too, depending on how much data you're trying to pull into. So it may not be like the pure set of data that you're getting. So that definitely can lead to some discrepancies between the two systems. It really depends on how big the gaps are. If you're seeing like 20 and 30% gaps, there might be more of a problem there and we have to kind of, we'd have to, have to look it into it. But if you're seeing one, two, 3% kind of differences, that's more than likely the, the case. Um, I will say if, and this isn't a looker studio to GA4 thing, but just in GA4, if, you're, if you have Google signals connected and turned on in GA4, that can cause a lot of thresholding issues where you're actually going to see data completely suppressed. Um, so you don't even see the data at all. That can cause a lot of issues. And there's ways around it, but just know if you're using Google signals, that can cause other issues. So there's, there's just some ways that Google is showing the data in the reporting that will cause some discrepancies depending on what screen and what reports you're looking at across Looker Studio, the exploration section here, and, uh, and the reporting section. Awesome, thanks. So another question is about the exploration tab. Okay. I'm very curious about it. <laughs> yeah, so let's look at that real quick. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start here in, um, in the landing page report and then we'll move our way over to exploration. So um, landing page report is a, can be a really helpful report for folks that are doing any sort of inbound, like you know, organic search, um, where you're doing a lot of content building and, and uh, maybe blog posting type of thing. Uh, so the landing page report can be really useful because it can identify those pages that are being people are entering your site from. So the landing page report here, um, the standard one's pretty good. 
Uh, you can add, like I was showing before, add some new metrics, like maybe bounce rate um, or engagement rate, whichever one you want to go with, because that's a good, a good gauge of, of understanding how those pages are performing. Um, but in this report, you also get, um, this will show you which page, which landing page is leading to conversions as well. Your time on site, this is just a demo of data, so don't worry about all these sick, these small increments. Um, but you can see here, we've got um, a lot of different uh, metrics you can use against the landing page reports. So in the exploration section, this is very different um, way to create your own report. So we could customize the reports as I showed you in the reporting section. Exploration gives you even more uh, data that you can um, uh, kind of stitch together and create different kind of reports. So it's almost a kind of a common, it's almost like an in-between between the reporting section and Looker Studio. Like Looker Studio, you can do a ton of stuff with and stitch a lot of data together. This exploration section is more kind of in the in-between. Um, it gives you different ways to visualize your data uh, inside the inside GA4 directly, and um, the data that comes through, you kind of you can yeah you can, you're able to stitch it together a little differently than you can in, in the main reporting. So usually, what I'll do, depending on the kind of reports that I want to create, I'll start with a blank report because um, if you start with one of the kind of templated ones, it throws a lot of a lot of data in there. I like to start start fresh. So I've got my, my blank report and right here I can start with a table. Um, so the first thing you can do is add a dimension. Um, so your dimensions are things like your channels or your pages or um, like uh, event names, things like that. So in this case, let's create, recreate that landing page report. Um, so I'm gonna add my landing page, if I can spell it, uh, landing page report here, landing pages here. So I, this basically just gonna add it to my library of things that I can pull from. So I'm going to add landing page. I'm going to add channel as well. So my session default channel group. Um, this is really critical when you're using explorations. There are three different channel groups. There's three different source mediums. There's three different mediums, three different campaign types. There's default channel group. There's first user and there's session. By default, I would always use the session default channel group with the word session in front of it, because that's gonna give you the data from the most recent visit in all your data. The one without the word session is only gonna show you channels that had a conversion. So if it doesn't have the word session in front of it, like this, it's gonna show, it's not gonna give you a full data set. It's only gonna show you sessions that had a conversion. So just be really wary of that um, and make sure you use the word session, the one with session before it. So I'm going to import those two dimensions, and then let's add a couple different uh, uh, metrics here. So I can do sessions, and um, let's do conversions, right? So we'll just do those two for now. So I've got these now available. Nothing's showing up on a report yet. Usually what I'll do, I'll just double click on it, and it pops it right into the right spot. So now it's under rows. I can double click here. It's gonna pop it into my values down here. And then let's pop in conversions as well. So now I've got a landing page report that has my URLs that drove the traffic, the session count from those, and then the number of conversions from people entering the site from those pages. And then I can take one more step. I can either add my channel group here if I wanna see what channels are driving that traffic. So I've got a lot unassigned here. Um, I can open that up and see a lot of different traffic coming, or a lot of different channels, or I can add segments. Um, so I can add a segment here and create a new one. So these segments allow you to kind of create filters that get stored and saved. So I can add a session segment. And in this case, let's do an organic social or an organic search report. So I'm gonna, again, select my session default channel group. And then I'm going to do uh, contains organic search okay, and apply that. Okay, and now I've got my organic search segment and it automatically, yep, once I create it, it automatically applies it to my report. So now I have a nice organic search report. Um, so I can pull off my channels because it's got already has that channel associated to it. And let's call this one organic search. 
Okay, so now I've got my organic search report. So that's one way to kind of create um, specific reporting. Um, exploration, um, you can do different visualizations as well. If you want to do pie charts and line charts for trending and things like that. Um, the one downside to these reports is they can be shared, but if you share them, everybody can ac have access if you share them, but they can't edit them at all. They're read only. They can't even change the dates. So what I would suggest that there's somebody in your organization that kind of is controlling these, I would basically select a date range that is flexible, like last 28 days instead of a, a finite date range. And then you name it organic search report, something like that. And then when you share it, so I can say, okay, I'm gonna share it now, but it says all users that have access to it have read only, will be in read only mode. I get why that's the case because you don't want people messing with your reports, but there's no way to allow anyone else to do it. So if, I, if you guys had access to my property here, you could see this report, but when you click into it, you can't change anything. All you can do is just see exactly how I set it up. So it's a pretty big limitation in my mind. Um, there are good ways and, and reason to use the exploration section. I tend to focus more in Looker Studio. I like it a lot better. It's a lot more flexible because uh, you can do a lot more with it. Um, but this is some of the ways you can create your exploration reports. Okay. Oh, we have another question, yes, right. about this. So it says from Perla, I know you can check if thresholds in the exploration tab in the upper right hand corner. Can you check that similarly in the reports tab? Yeah, so in the reports tab here, you will have, if there is any issues, it'll show up here. Um, and um, what they're referring to is uh, there's sampling that can happen. There's thresholding that can happen. Um, and the sampling means that Google is just not, is basically kind of modeling out the data and only giving you a smaller set of the data to display because maybe there's too much data for it to process. And so then it'll sample it. Um, these, these reports here, tend to do a better job of, of we've got 100%. I don't have a whole lot of traffic in this demo account. Um, but you, if you ever see any kind of notifications here, um, you may want to check and see uh, if you're getting sample data or not. Or there might be another alert that says thresholding has been applied. The thresholding being applied is when not when it's sampled, but when Google just won't even show the data. And that's where I mentioned before, if you have Google signals turned on, that what Google Signals does is it um, allows data coming from um, logged in users on Google. It uses that data to kind of um, understand who that user is and pass that information to GA4 for uh, to enrich the data. And the the most the kind of the best example of that is if I'm logged in on my mobile device on my phone and I'm logged in in desktop. Usually Google has no idea those are two different users because it's two different devices, two different cookies are set. And so um, that's, I'm two different users in the reporting here. If you have Google signals turned on and I'm a Google user and I'm logged into Google, I'm logged into Chrome on my phone and on, on, uh, on my desktop, Google knows I'm the same user and will stitch that data together and in the reporting only show me as one user. And that only happens if you have Google signals turned on. But if you have Google signals turned on, because there's some privacy issues, Google will actually suppress the data and put thresholds on the data that shows up in these reports, because there might be a chance you might be able to find out an individual who an individual is if, um, if there's not enough data in the reporting to kind of hide it effectively. So just beware if you are, and I'll, I'll jump to here where you set Google signals up. Um, there's this data collection section here this Google signals data collection, this allows you to turn this on or off. Um, and that's, if it is on, that could cause those issues. Okay, All other right. questions? Uh, we don't have anything pending. Okay. If anyone has any other questions, do it now <laughs> as the now because we have six minutes left. And if there, are, if there aren't any more questions, I would like to ask a question. Yeah, of course. So uh, the last one. So what can, be, what can we expect to see in the direct 
bucket uh, because we do have an undefined bucket in GA4. Yeah, good question. Yeah, so I'll, I'll touch on both of those, unassigned and direct. Um, so direct means that, do I have any direct? Again, this is my demo account. I think I should have some direct. Yeah, I've got very little direct. Direct means that Google didn't get a referring source of traffic sent over to it when the session started. What that, and usually that is someone goes to your website and types in the address in the address bar and they get there. Like they didn't have a link they clicked on or they didn't come from any other source. In reality, it just means that Google doesn't know where it came from. Um, that's where direct, everything falls into direct. Google has this new channel called unassigned. It used to actually be called other. So it's, it's not new, it's just changed, it's changed the name of it. So unassigned, mostly is let's let me add a source here or sorry let me add a sign i'm going to add a sort our source medium here um so if you have a lot of stuff falling into unassigned there's two things that can happen a lot of times it comes in as not set people don't have a great explanation of why a lot of traffic falls into not set um, there is some thoughts about it's a session that starts without a session start event. And there's all this technical explanations of why, but nobody has a really good as people like actually figure it out and say, this is why. So just be, don't be surprised if you see some not set traffic falling into unassigned. There's not a lot you can do about it necessarily. But if you do see source mediums coming in here, where you control the UTM parameters and they're just not falling into the, a channel, it's because the rules aren't being followed. So as we were talking about before with the UTM um, setup, um, the, in this case, I have traffic coming from FBIG, so Facebook, Instagram. Well, I didn't set it up right. FBIG is not recognized by Google. It has to say the word Facebook or Instagram, and this has to be the word social or paid social or something like that. If that was the case, it would have fallen into the paid social bucket or the organic social bucket because it's not, it's falling into unassigned. So if you do have any chance, any um, case where you are fall, have a lot of traffic falling into unassigned, um, look at your source medium, add your source medium here, and then make adjustment to UTM parameters so that it falls in the right bucket. Does that answer your question? Right. Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay, so uh, we do have three more questions, but we have three minutes. Let's do so, it. Um, yeah. So let's shoot the 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 first one that uh, came in. Is there a way to filter for non-branding traffic? Um, unfortunately, no. Um, not not through organic non-branded. Uh, paid paid not paid. If you're doing paid non-branded, then yes. Um, however, you can connect uh, Search Console to GA4 and um, there, under this admin section, there is a place to add Search Console right here. If you connect it, then you go into your library as I showed before, and you can add a new report for Search Console. This allows you to see the queries that came up, and then um, it can also do, you can also you know, basically get to your non-brand by doing searches and filtering. So you could add some filters here that say uh, whatever your brand or non-brand is. So there is a way around it, but it would only exist in the search console section. It wouldn't show up in any of the other reports because Google doesn't pass over organic keyword data like it used to way back many years ago. All right. So I took a screenshot of the two remaining questions. So maybe we can answer them over email or on a Loom video because we just have one minute uh, left for this and yeah I just wanted to say thank you and thank you to everyone there for your questions uh, so one of them was if we are going to host a Booker Studio session soon maybe you can say Steve hey. if you are going to let's do it sounds good to me <laughs> yeah all right so yeah I think we'll we'll keep in touch if um, there is any other follow-ups to this and uh, we can share where, where, what is the best way to, to reach out to you, Steve? Um, yeah. So two places, LinkedIn, I'm pretty active there depending on how busy I am, but yeah, LinkedIn, um, you can find me there. I'm just Steve Lamar 
And then uh, really good data is where uh, if you wanted to reach out for any like more customized trainings, I do like private trainings and also any kind of GA4 migration setup, anything like that. So I'm happy to answer questions. I've got a little form there or yeah, so you can send me a, a chat that way too. All right. So we are out of time, but we can send everything over email. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Five, four, three, and we go. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.